Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are while you are listening to this webinar. I'm very pleased to present this webinar along with some of my colleagues on assessing fairly an introduction to the national guidelines for post-conviction risk and needs assessment. My name is David DeMora. I am a senior policy advisor at the Council of State Governments Justice Center, where I work on a variety of projects, including the uh, a focus on risk and needs assessment. And what we're going to be talking about today is the result of a project that occurred starting about four and a half years ago and took about three years worth of work to get to the end to do the development of national guidelines for the use of post-conviction risk and needs assessment. The National Guidelines is a project that was developed in partnership between the Bureau of Justice Assistance and the CSG Justice Center. Today's presentation is going to cover a number of areas. First of all, we'll talk a bit about why is there a need for guidelines? What do we need to do about this and how did this come about? And then we'll talk about an overview. We'll give an overview of the guidelines. We'll have some discussion about practical application of the guidelines. And we'll talk about resources and next steps. We also fortunately have two guests with us today who will talk about some of the work they are doing in their states with the national guidelines. And so as we move toward that part of the presentation, we'll introduce our guests and really talk a little bit about very much practically, what are we thinking about? What are we talking about when we're discussing these guidelines? In point of fact, there is definitely a need for a standardized approach to risk and needs assessment tools across the nation because, frankly, right now they're all over the place. There are uh, roughly 20 or 25 tools that are the most commonly used in various corrections and judicial agencies but there are upwards of several hundred of them in play across the country. And one of the problems is that they're developed and they're used differently. And states really more and more want to ensure the use of assessment instruments does not increase disparities within the criminal justice system. We know that there are clearly disparities when we look at issues of gender, when we look at issues of race, ethnicity, and culture. There are clear disparities within the criminal justice system, and every time we assess in every state that we have looked at, we find those disparities. One of the concerns that's, that has arisen uh, is that risk and needs assessment used poorly or poor risk and needs assessment tools can actually increase disparities. And there have been perceptions of unfairness, and I say perceptions because while there's clearly unfairness in the system and while clearly there are concerns, there, the concerns don't always match what the particular problem is. In other words, a concern might be with a tool itself, but in fact, it becomes the use of the tool or the inappropriate development of the tool that is the problem, not the fact that there is a tool to look at these things. And so there are concerns about unfairness as well as a lack of transparency, which is very genuine. What is under the hood? People want to know what is actually being measured and assessed, and how does this impact the person who is being assessed, as well as all of those around him or her, his family members and significant others. In 2017, 48 states actually reported using risk assessment instruments for folks on parole. Two states didn't have post-custody supervision populations, so they did not use risk and need assessments. 45 states reported using risk and needs assessments for people on probation. At that time, five states didn't respond. They reported, uh, or they reported that they were not using risk and need instruments, or they did not know if they use risk and need instruments, which suggests that perhaps they either were not using them, or in fact, uh, they were not using them in a way that was very useful for people that were on supervision for probation. National coverage starting several years ago, six, seven, eight years ago, roughly, the tools, the coverage really fuel concerns about disparate outcomes for people of color. And you can see here a lot of different headlines. One of the problems is that the concerns are valid and we need to make sure that risk and needs tools do not increase disparity. However, one of the problems with a lot of the coverage is that it tended to be, um, let's say, general coverage, right? Newspaper coverage or advocacy organization coverage, 
not necessarily coverage that was attacking the scientific problem. It was raising valid and appropriate concerns, but not, but sometimes missing the mark, if you will, on why those concerns exist and trying to narrow it down to the specific issue of the tool when in fact the problem with bias in our system is so much greater than the use of any particular tool. Having been around for a very long time in my work and having been around long before the existence of the development of these tools, I can honestly say that we made as bad or frankly much worse decisions prior to the introduction of the use of risk and need tools. The unconscious bias that we have, that everybody has, frankly, the conscious bias, the decisions that were made by individuals without good information, whether we're talking about clinicians or prosecutors or supervising officers or judges, routinely made decisions that were very problematic. And we can see that by looking historically as mass incarceration started, and we can see that way before the use of risk and needs tools, that the, the people of color in terms of being incarcerated and supervised had much larger numbers of being on supervision or incarceration. And this is very much the result of decisions being made without supportive tools to more objectively tell us what is the difficulty, what are the concerns, and how do we respond to those issues. The coverage did raise very important questions about bias. And again, you can see a couple of comments here. Algorithmic decision-making tools are only as smart as the inputs to the system. Biases in data sets will not only be replicated in the results, they may actually be exacerbated, a very fair statement. And you see here with then Senators Cory Booker, Richard Durbin, and Kamala Harris, and Representative Sheila Lee Jackson Lee and John Lewis, Research shows that risk assessments often do not accurately predict risk and can produce results that are biased against people of color, particularly African-Americans. And again, a valid concern. When we look at the research, that is not true that they always do that. There are definitely risk tools that are problematic, and there are clearly risk tools that have taken into account these issues. And when we look at predictive accuracy, they're predictively accurate. But where this comment is appropriate is the fact that it's predictively accurate does not necessarily mean that it is fair and that it is transparent. Because even if it's predictively accurate, it may be predictively accurate, not because of the internal or inherent risk of the individual, but because of how the system operates. How, the, how law enforcement operates, how prosecutors operate, how judicial systems operate. And so in point of fact, while the tool may be accurate, it may still be biased if we don't take into account these other issues. It is in fact true that historically, many instrument validations did not include a statistical test for accuracy across race, ethnicity, and gender, but the field is shifting in this area in discussions over the last couple of years with multiple states, every state that we have spoken with who are looking at revalidating their tools or validating for the first time a tool are really looking at this issue uh, of race and ethnicity and gender in ways that historically, quite bluntly, states and jurisdictions have not done. And that is a very positive development that we're seeing. Another difficulty, as I alluded to already, is that there's often a lack of transparency in explaining the instrument's use, the fairness of it, and the accuracy of it to those folks who undergo the assessments. In other words, our communication about the results is often very poor to criminal justice stakeholders and to the broader public. I often say when I'm talking to colleagues, whether that's clinical colleagues or superv supervision colleagues, is that we have a shorthand and we talk about these things routinely and we understand what we mean. But when we try to talk to other folks, sometimes I jokingly say, when we try to talk to normal people, 
They, they don't understand what we're saying. They misinterpret what our meaning is. And that often that misinterpretation can be negative and can have a negative impact because they think we're saying one thing when in fact we're saying something else. So the guidelines really overarchingly pose three questions to help policymakers and practitioners. The first is, what's the degree of accuracy that the post-conviction risk and needs assessment instrument should meet? Secondly, how can users best determine the fairness of the instruments across race, ethnicity, and gender, particularly given the history of bias and disparities within the criminal justice system? And thirdly, in what way should information about the use of these instruments and their underlying algorithms be transparent and be communicated publicly? So the methodology in terms of the work that we did followed this construct. The first issue was that we wanted to understand the current state of the field. So we really looked at all of the literature out there. We hardly were the first persons to be looking at this, but we wanted to gather all of the information that was put together and put it into one document, if you will, and reach a, a set of recommendations and guidelines that resulted from the work of many, many folks that have started this work over the last decade. <clears throat> so we then did a foundational survey looking at definitions of fairness, accuracy, transparency, inter-rater agreement or reliability, fidelity, and validation and revalidation. In other words, we had to agree on definitions of what these things meant. And we did all of this with an advisory group that I will show you in a moment. The second phase was really parsing out what we meant by fairness, how we look at the issue of improving equity, and also considering the context of the use of risk and needs tools. From there, we developed a consensus survey with six questions defining risk and needs, improving equity, and risk and needs assessment contexts for the advisory group to consider. And then finally, we really looked at the third phase of effectiveness of communication, where things really fall down. We would argue that it is not that difficult to get a good tool it is much more difficult to implement a good tool with fidelity and to communicate the results of those tools effectively. All of this, again, worked through the advisory group of our folks and ultimately then developed the proposed guidelines, which would be consensus that we reached on the highest ranked factors. The advisory group consider, uh, consisted of 26 members, and it consisted of a lot of different folks, folks who were uh, experts, if you will, in risk and needs assessment, folks who were experts in supervision of folks who, in the criminal justice system, folks who were experts in the traditional method of risk and needs assessment, meaning uh, using things like logistic regression, as well as folks who are expert in machine learning when we were looking at this, and folks who were administrators who were having to deal with the reality of putting these things into the system as well as folks who are experts in looking at the issue of bias and lack of equity in the criminal justice system. One of our advisory board members was Dr. Ed Latessa. Many of you, no doubt, have known throughout your career, Dr. Latessa was a pioneer in this work. Sadly, he left us all too soon, a couple of years ago. We are very pleased that we are able to really take these guidelines and put them forth in his honor in the work that he did for so many decades in this field. The guidelines address gaps in how tools are administered and they provide some additional benefits. Uh, it helps us with better decisions, helps limit our bias or reduce our bias, helps increase accuracy in terms of decision-making, and it helps promote both rehabilitation or habilitation and public safety. And both of those are equally important. And they are not opposite things. A lot of times folks get into this false argument about, well, we're either for the individual or we're for public safety. Arguably, if we're for the individual, we are for public safety. If the individual is doing better, if the individual is leading a good life, and if the individual is safe in their behavior, then we have increased public safety significantly. The guidelines are post-conviction. They pertain specifically to the use of post-conviction risk and needs assessment instruments to inform decisions and case planning that occur after the court uh, disposition, specifically after conviction and sentencing. 
Now they can also be used in the application of assessment results to informed uh, to inform decision making and case planning in the context of alternative forms of processing, such as after a decision has been made to offer a diversion program. Sometimes they are also uh, the tools are also utilized at a pre-sentence level, pre-sentence investigation, but post-conviction. It's not that these guidelines are not relevant to things, for example, such as pretrial assessment, but specifically we wanted to look at, and we felt it was important to look at the issue of post-conviction risk and needs assessment because they so much drive the life of that individual for one, two, three, four, five or more years while they are under supervision and attempting to meet the particular requirements of whatever their case plan may be. So we'll move from there to an overview of the guidelines. They launched August 30th, 2022 on BJA's Public Safety Risk Assessment Clearinghouse website, as well as the CSG Justice Center website. And the actual title, as you see here, is Advancing Fairness and Transparency, National Guidelines for Post-Conviction Risk and Needs Assessment. And you can use your phone on this uh, little symbol here, and it will bring you directly to that if you would like to take the easy way, uh, or else you can type in these different web addresses and you will get to the guidelines. The guidelines have four sections to them. The first one is, again, I've mentioned accuracy. The second, fairness. The third, transparency. And the fourth, communication and use. Ultimately, there are 13 guidelines. And the first one, again, or the first set of ones have to do with accuracy. And accuracy refers to the degree to which assessment results predict the recidivism outcomes they were designed to predict. And that word or that phrase, designed to predict, is extremely important. One of the problems that we often see is that the tools are used to make statements about individuals they were never designed to do. And that's an implementation issue. But Tools are accurate when they are predicting the outcomes they were designed to predict. And we need to make sure that we stick to talking about what they were designed to predict. The guidelines for accuracy include first conducting a local evaluation and that local might mean uh, state. Sometimes it might mean county, it depends. Generally speaking, we look when we look at validations, we tend to be looking at state validations most of the time. Uh, obviously take in, taking into account that there are variations within the state, but when we do that validation, we want to be able to account for that. So conducting a local evaluation of the post-conviction risk and needs assessment instrument to ensure that the instrument's suitable for the agency's population, right? Is it the right instrument for the right folks? Secondly, to meet minimum performance thresholds of post-conviction risk and needs assessments that are completed in the field, according to current statistical standards. And while we won't go in depth to the in uh, these different areas for this particular presentation, when you get to the guidelines, if you um, use your phone, if you will, to get to the guidelines to, from the previous slide, you'll see there where it talks about what those standards are, how to think about that, and how, how to really have a bottom line, if you will, in terms of what they need to meet in terms of performance thresholds. Third, using a CQI or continuous quality improvement process to ensure successful implementation of the post-conviction risk and needs assessment instrument. And that becomes extremely important. The, we're way past the years of a train and pray. We're, we're, we cannot simply train folks, tell them to do it this way, and then hope it will work over time. We know that it tends to get worse over time if we don't have a CQI process. This isn't because of bad people or any bad intentions. It's just sort of a normal falling down, if you will, of a process over time. People get too comfortable with something. Uh, people begin to sometimes take shortcuts when they're doing certain things. People get into, I've done 10 or 12 of these, so I already know what the answer is going to be. There are a lot of reasons that it happens. It has nothing to do with bad intentions, but it does ultimately decrease the accuracy of the tool. And so you need an ongoing coaching and quality improvement process to make sure that those tools are both uh, accurately scored 
and also used appropriately, meaning used for what they were intended to be used for. And then fourth, to use a multi-step approach to assess risk and needs over time, which simply means you don't do it once and then that's it, right? You, you want to reassess individuals at appropriate periods of time, at appropriate intervals. And for many places that might be six months, for some places that might be a year. Pretty much we don't wanna go past a year. And depending on the situation and the specifics, six months or a year is appropriate. And again, discussion of that can be seen both within the document and when we talk about providing some technical assistance, we can also talk about how do you make some of the decisions about sort of different levels of risk of individual, what makes sense in terms of speed of reassessment, what you want to look at, what how much time it takes for change to occur, et cetera. The second concept here is that of fairness. And fairness is the degree to which assessment results have the same meanings and applications across groups defined by race, ethnicity, gender, or other characteristics, for example, such as mental illness. And fairness becomes extremely important. A tool should not just be accurate, it should also be fair. And that becomes very important. And one of the reasons I think that we have seen some of the valid concerns about the use of risk and need assessment is that people spent a lot of time making sure tools were accurate, and that's appropriate. But they spent much less time thinking about the issue of fairness, not really thinking about how external situations could impact the fairness of the tool, no matter how accurate that tool might be. So there are some guidelines related to fairness as well. First, examine the results of the post-conviction risk and needs instrument for predictive bias and disparate impact across groups. This becomes extremely important because if, if this occurs, then you're going to actually be decreasing fairness and equity. And there are two components here, right? There's the issue of predictive bias and we can control for that, but we might still then have disparate impact across groups, depending on what is going on in the particular uh, area where those folks li live, right? What's happening within the system around them. You need to apply the post-conviction risk and needs assessment results to individual cases in keeping with the r, &R principles. And this becomes very important. Um, I've seen some situations, so I assume that most people that are listening to this know the risk-need responsivity model. And what it talks about is, of course, there are certain criminogenic factors or risk factors, and there are what people call the central eight, seven of them being dynamic or changeable that are directly related to criminogenic risk. And then there's the issue of need, and need is basically the flip side of the risk, right? If you have a particular risk factor, in order to mitigate that, you look at the needs that are related to that risk factor. And then the third component of that is responsivity, which has to do with one, what's called general responsivity, which is what are the best kinds of programming that we have in order to respond to these issues? And what the research tells us is that at this point, really the best programs we have are cognitive in nature. And then there's what's called specific responsivity, which is the individual, right? Age, gender, race, ethnicity, education, uh, cognitive ability, and a whole variety of other things. Interestingly, over the last several decades, we focused a lot on risk. We began to understand we needed to focus on need. And we've not focused very much on responsivity, which is unfortunate because at the end of the day, not focusing on the responsivity component in the model really minimizes our ability to be effective in mitigating risk and in meeting the needs of individuals who are in the criminal justice system. The second thing that I've seen happening that is problematic is I've seen some places moving away from thinking about risk, need, and responsivity. And this started as the result of very genuine and fair issues. What we understand now is that the original model was a little too limited. It has changed over the years. And we now understand things such as adverse childhood experiences. We understand the role of trauma. 
We understand the role of mental illness and substance use disorder and how these have a role in the folks, a role in getting folks into our criminal justice system. That, that the majority of folks in our criminal justice system have some constellation of these issues. And these issues do in fact all fit under responsivity, which we have not done a very good job with. And we are now learning we need to be more understanding and more effective and educated around understanding these issues and that our responses need to include them when we're doing this work, because we're not going to be able to minimize or mitigate those folks who are higher risk if all of these other things are in the way. Or to put it another way, if somebody is experiencing severe trauma, the idea that a cognitive program will be effective makes no sense. You need to resolve the trauma issues. Maybe that's at the same time as you're doing the cognitive program. Maybe it's before, but you need to respond. The mistake that I see happening in some areas is just focusing on those other areas, mental illness, trauma, adverse childhood experiences, et cetera, and dropping the risk need responsivity model. That is a big fail. That is a mistake. We already know that resolving those issues, if somebody also has high criminogenic need, we already know from the 70s, 80s, and 90s that that will not solve the problem. So we need to be careful not to go to what we uh, go to what we already failed with, if you will. But we need to learn how to build on the risk need model and to bring in these other extremely important components so that those folks who are the highest risk and need can be helped more effectively. For those folks who are the lowest risk and need, they may only need those things and they don't need the uh, other cognitive programs. The seventh item in fairness is adopting agency-wide strategies to minimize the potential that local implementation doesn't promote disparities. Uh, each agency needs to have clear policies about the use, about what they mean by fairness, how they expect their supervisors, their agents to uh, apply the tools and how they expect their uh, supervisors or agents to really demonstrate that they are being fair in the use of the risk and needs results. The third uh, part of this wheel is that of transparency, which refers to how information about the content, the structure, and the application of the instruments is disseminated to stakeholders. How we talk about them, how we talk about what's in them, how we talk about how they were structured and developed, how we talk about how we're applying them and why we are using them with particular individuals. We need to provide stakeholders with relevant and appropriate information on the development, the intended use, and the validation of the post-conviction risk and needs instrument. There needs to be a written policy that guides the local use of the post-conviction risk and needs instrument. And we need to be able to communicate both the strengths and the limitations of post-conviction risk and needs assessment instruments to the general public so that they understand what we're doing. And the general public might mean family members, it might mean advocacy organizations, it might mean just, it might mean legislators, right? Uh, it might mean administrators, because sometimes even administrators in the system don't fully understand uh, what the strengths and limitations of the tool are. And it is important to acknowledge that there are limitations. These are not end-all, be-alls. They are not the only thing. There is no one tool that solves everything. I mentioned in previous slides a number of other issues related to responsivity that we might need to assess and look at differently, uh, or rather with different tools and in different ways, whether that's through clinical assessment or that's through the use of other screens and tools. We need to be very clear, this is what we are measuring with this tool. This is the strength of this tool and what it helps us do. And here's what it's not doing for us. Sometimes I see people use risk and needs tools to determine whether somebody should be incarcerated or not. They were not developed for that. It's an inappropriate use of the tool. The tools were designed to help us understand the intensity of intervention that's required. And that might mean the intensity of supervision, but really it means the intensity of intervention. And supervision is one component of intervention and, and hardly the only one, right? In terms of looking at making change, 
the change comes from the programming. It comes from the relationship between the supervising officer and their client. It comes from the work that is done in cognitive programming, whether that's done through a supervising agency or through a community program, through a clinical program, whatever. There are a number of different ways. And when we look at those different issues, we need to understand that the tools were developed to help us un to help us make a good decision about what do we need to build around the individual to assure that he or she will be able to make it, what's the intensity we need, both in terms of one, helping them make sure they do well through supervision, and two, helping them change through supervision and through programming. And that really is what they were developed to do. A lot of times what we see are, uh, again, a misuse of them. And we say, oh, because of the results of this tool, we are going to whatever, whether it's incarceration or it's something else. But if you go back and look at the uh, instructions and the, what, the, what they say the tool is designed to do, you will find that there's a disconnect between that decision making and what the, what the tool is designed to do. And the fourth part of the wheel is communication and use. Communication and use refers to the fact uh, that the manner in which the individual assessment results are communicated and used can greatly affect their impact on decision making and consequently their effectiveness. What does that mean? Well, if we just go around saying, well, this guy's high risk, that certainly is one way that we're communicating something and that has a certain impact when somebody listens to that. If we go around and we say, this person has a significant number of needs that really need some intervention and some response. That's a slightly different way of talking about it. One of the things that's happened over the course of, again, the last 20, 30 years is that even though the majority of tools are risk and need tools, we shortcut and we talk about them as risk tools, which then actually changes our thinking. And when we talk about them and when we think about them, we really get stuck on thinking about risk and we drop the other pieces, not purposefully, you know, not, not because we want to, it just happens. Our language is important. And so one of the reasons that you see throughout all of this presentation and throughout all of the documentation of what we developed is you constantly see risk and need, risk and need, risk and need, because we need to understand, no pun intended, that need is an extremely important component of what we're talking about, because that's what's changeable. You only mitigate risk by meeting needs. Risk is a static thing, meaning there's a risk. What do you do with that? You don't do anything with that. You now know intensity that's needed. It's the needs that make the difference, all right? Now, how we communicate that information becomes important. Because we have shortcut these things over the years, we often simply talk about the risk. Globally, I'm speaking when I say we. We often just talk about the risk. In fact, we should be leading with the needs. We should be saying something like, this individual has a significant number of needs, and by meeting these needs, we can minimize the risk level that they are at. It's not that we're ignoring the risk level. It's that we don't necessarily um, have to lead with that. And what we need to be leading with are what are the things we need to do in order to make those things better. So there are some guidelines, again, for communication and use. And the first one is to anchor the communication of the results in the risk need responsivity principles that I've mentioned, particularly thinking about the need component as well as the responsivity component. I would argue that when we start writing reports about this, not only should we be taught or, or presenting to court, not only should we be talking about what the needs are specifically and why we are talking about the responses that are necessary, we should also be talking about responsivity factors and we should be listing those things and we should be saying, and here are the issues. And it's sort of a twofold process, if you will. Issue one is here are the specific responsivity factors because of, again, age, gender, culture, race, ethnicity. And secondly, here are the things that we need to also integrate in the work that we're doing in order to be effective. Issues about, again, whether it's trauma, uh, whether it's mental health treatment, whether it's some type of substance use treatment, which might be a criminogenic risk issue, or it might be a, a, a responsivity issue in terms of that, so that we need to sort of spell those things out. 
as opposed to what we often see, which is, well, this person's high risk, so here's the 14 things they need to do. And there's no order of that, and it just sounds scary. It really doesn't sound how to move things forward. We need to contextualize the results of the post-conviction risk and needs assessment instruments. This is what it means. This is what it doesn't mean. And we need to develop a template for communicating the results of the post-conviction risk and needs assessment instruments to all of the relevant stakeholders, including the person being assessed. And as part of the work that we are doing at the Council of State Governments Justice Center that the Bureau of Justice Assistance has asked us to do is that we are indeed developing templates, communication templates, to talk to a wide variety of different stakeholders. And the idea is to develop templates so that states can then take them and personalize them to their particular states and needs, but that will allow them to have uh, a blueprint, if you will, when they're talking to the person being assessed, to that individual's family, to legislators, judges, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, from there, we're going to move to the practical application of the guidelines. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Laiz Tavares. All right, hello everyone. My name is Laiz Tavares. I am a project manager at the CSG Justice Center, working on the national guidelines since the start alongside David. Um, for this portion of the presentation, we're going to discuss the practical application and benefits of the guidelines for various audiences. So let's start with practitioners um, and organizational benefits. So for practitioners who use risk and needs assessment on a day-to-day -day basis, these guidelines provide clarity, inform case planning, and promote buy-in from the people they assess. This can be achieved through improved clarity on the use and implementation of tools, competency to answer questions about the tools, implementation fidelity to ensure accuracy of results, as well as more targeted resource allocation and targeted supervision practices. Um, a fifth item here is also better outcomes and reduced disparities and costs. When you look at the guidelines for people in the criminal justice system, there are also benefits. Um, this can be seen through mitigation of bias to promote equity, more understanding of the full person and the context surrounding their system involvement, right? So it's always important to consider the people that are being assessed. Um, third is increased understanding of what assessment results mean and how they are used. Remember, results have meaning um, and use. They should not just be added to the file, right? You have to consider what they mean and how this is going to affect the person being assessed. And last, um, they help to create trust and understanding through clarity, consistency, and transparency. When you look at the potential benefits for stakeholders and the community, we talk about opportunity to be involved in the process and an understanding of the appropriate use and limitations of the risk and needs assessment instrument. It can help to improve trust and buy-in from stakeholders and others using results and better communication of those results. Also through better collaboration among stakeholders, everyone can be now speaking the same language and that will help you see more integrated treatment planning. And finally, you can also, again, help to target resources and funding where it is the most impactful. Improved funding allocation allows for targeted investments and decisions saving taxpayer dollars. Finally, these guidelines equip researchers with the concrete steps needed to evaluate whether risk and needs assessment practices align with the principles of accuracy, fairness, transparency, and the effective communication and use. This can be seen through better sustainability of training and CQI related efforts, evaluation of tools to improve trust and results, having improved fidelity and accuracy in the implementation process, and finally, the effectiveness of the tool to provide validity and appropriateness for the population. I will now hand it back to David to introduce our guest speakers and facilitate a brief panel discussion to help us see how these guidelines are being adopted and how it, and some of the benefits for the states that are working to adopt and implement the guidelines. Thanks, Liz. I'm pleased that we have two guests with us. Uh, so one of the things that 
resulted from the development of these guidelines is that the Bureau of Justice Assistance asked us to work with states to provide technical assistance on the implementation of the guidelines. And so we have been doing that. And two of the states that we're working with uh, are with us today. The first state uh, is Massachusetts, and we have with us Deputy Commissioner of Field Services, Brian Marisolo from Massachusetts. And we have with us Director Tammy Jo Lieber of the uh, Candy Ojai Community Corrections Department in the state of Minnesota. And these folks are both working with us along with many other of their many of their colleagues uh, in their respective states. And what we would like to do is just have a little bit of a discussion with them around what's going on in their states and how they sort of came to all of this. And to do that, I'm gonna stop sharing so that we can see one another as we are doing now. And uh, I think I'll start with uh, Tammy Jo, if I may, and simply maybe to begin with, maybe you could tell us and tell the folks that are listening and watching a little bit about your state and uh, sort of how you came to think about these issues and what some of the struggles have been historically around this. Good morning, um, I'm Tammy Jo. Yes, thank you. Um, one, Minnesota is a very, very unique state. One of the reasons that I think CSG has been involved with us for a very long time. Um, some of our challenges are, again, very unique in terms of the fact that we, to give you a little background in history, is we have three separate delivery system for, for probation services in the state of Minnesota. Um, this started back in 1976, and so it's created um, for variety of very positive reasons having three delivery systems, but it also created a lot of challenges in terms of evidence-based practices and specifically in risk assessment. Um, Council of State Governments has been working with us and helping us try and get to a point of understanding for actually several years, um, even with as frustrating and conflicting as our state has been, they've stuck with us through this whole process. Um, when I talk about three delivery systems, we have Community Corrections Act counties, which is what I'm a part of, um, which supervise approximately 72% of the um, population um, in the state right now. We also have county probation officers that supervise about 11% of the state, and then about 17% um, are su supervised by the Department of Corrections. The reason this had become so challenging for our department on all of these broader, on these issues, was the fact that um, because we had three, not only did we have three separate delivery systems, we had three separate funding systems that put us in direct competition with each other. The reason this impacted the risk assessment process in our state is because that made it almost difficult for us to communicate. And we very much did not get along a lot of times with our different delivery systems, had very different opinions of what was going on. And so for us to actually make progress, um, at one point, I think um, CSG was with us for a year trying to just talk about um, risk assessment tools and if we should stay with the LSCMI or if we should go to other tools. And we just couldn't come to an agreement. And part of that really... I believe, was centered into um, our direct competition, as I described. Since that time period, we have backtracked a little bit. And even though we had many, many years of not getting along, in the last year and a half with CSG's help, we have actually moved forward as a group, changed our legislation for funding, and come forward with the idea of the fact that now that we have that big piece together, we can work together on addressing some of these other factors. Um, the biggest challenge I see with us right now really comes down to that we have so many things to address and change in Minnesota. Minnesota. We have so many different committees and trying to establish how each one works together and addresses these individual differences. Part of that process for risk assessments has really been looking at um, exactly the same thing things David talked about, um, looking at um, the disparities in our state. We are also unique or at least have a lot of challenges in that area that we have 14 separate tribal nations that are identified, plus many others that are smaller in our state with many different reservations. We have seen a huge disparity between the population, Native American population, and who's incarcerated. Um, as part of that, we, we've been looking at how does that risk assessment tool address for that. Um, gender has been an ongoing issue of how is the LSCMI 
play and um, different things that we're looking at addressing um, gender disparity issues across our state. At the same time, we also have to deal with some of the other things that were also part of those specific guidelines in terms of validation. Because we spent many, many years trying to fight over or come to a, um, a consensus on what tool to use, over the last couple of years, we have really lacked in training. Um, our our LSCMI trainers have not, we haven't had as many train the trainer events and the training across the state has kind of dwindled. So we almost are going to have to rebuild now that we have officially decided that we are staying with the LSCMI to address our fidelity issues and our iterator reliability across the state. Another area that this delivery system and our and communication across our state has created issues is we don't have any standardization for cutoff scores or what high, low, medium risk it means across our state. Um, you can go from one area of the state to the other, which is a pretty, Minnesota is a pretty big state. Um, with very rural and very metro areas to deal with. And so it can be very different what that means from um, Little Red Lake Falls, Minnesota to Minneapolis um, for what those scores mean. So the accuracy, fairness, fidelity, and how we um, move forward with that is really where we're building right now on how, how do we create those across the state, standardize, and then um, work with fidelity. Great, thank you very much, uh, Tammy Joe. Appreciate that. That was that's a. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to record. I'm, I'm going to take that recording and use that because that perfectly encapsulated all of the all of the issues and items. Um, Brian, if you would please tell us a little bit in terms of Massachusetts uh, about the state and sort of how you got to this and some of the issues that you're facing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, a lot of similarities with Tammy Joe, but then a lot of differences, uh, as and any kind of jurisdiction would have. Uh, in Massachusetts, we we have the luxury of actually kind of being a unified system here. So uh, we're one state system for probation, and we reside in the judiciary, uh, so the judicial branch of government here in Massachusetts. And the Massachusetts Probation Service has 105 probation departments across the state ranging from uh, civil matters and probate and family courts, uh, mostly civil matters in our juvenile courts, all the way to adult criminal matters in our, our district courts and our superior courts. Um, you know, with the 105 departments we have, um, really come some challenges around scale and uh, making sure we're uniform in, in what we're doing. Uh, a big, you know, kind of challenge for us over the past decade is that we've transitioned from really using a tool that was popular in the 1970s that um, primarily dealt with risk on that end, got a little bit into responsivity and really didn't touch much at all on criminogenic needs. Um, so about 10 years ago, a little bit more than 10 years ago, we transitioned to the ORAS, so the Ohio Risk Assessment on that end, which um, much more robust tool uh, certainly, you know, gives you the risk piece, but also uh, I think, uh, as a lot of practitioners would probably say, the more important pieces of that are the, the criminogenic needs piece and that responsivity piece. Um, and it's a big culture shift for, for a large organization on that end where, um, you know, a lot of officers just kind of used to using a tool that maybe took 15 minutes to complete to, uh, you know, a tool that is going to give you a lot more information and takes more time to complete. Um, and also, you know, on that end, we weren't really doing a ton of case planning prior to using the ORAS either. So another shift on that and just trying to get folks to, you know, really buy into, okay, we're, you know, we understand the risk level, but what are those dynamic criminogenic needs and those responsivity factors that are really going to drive the case planning and the time we're spending with each of the folks we have on our caseloads. Um, and, and I think a lot of the kind of anxiety around change in general usually comes, you know, from folks who maybe don't naturally have that skill set that's going to bring them to the forefront in the transition. So just a lot of, you know, kind of organizational planning for, for that big shift and ensuring folks have the opportunities to kind of build those skills, 
uh, whether they're motivational interviewing skills or just understanding the risk need responsivity concepts, the case planning concepts, and um, really getting at kind of, uh, you know, uh, people often are, you know, unsettled with change. Uh, bureaucratic process in general is, is painful. Um, so adding more time on is not an easy thing and trying to, you know, really help folks understand that it's not being done for the sake of making their lives more difficult on the ground. It's actually tied into the mission of the organization and really what motivates the vast majority of our workforce every day, which is, you know, trying to help people get to a better place in life and trying to help make communities better places to live in. So uh, that's uh, just kind of a short version of uh, an overview of some of those challenges we faced uh, kind of at the large scale uh, in sure. our career. Brian, um, did Massachusetts ever validate the ORAS in Massachusetts? We did, yes. Um, we, we did a validation study, I want to say probably about five years ago, maybe a little bit less. Um, went out, you know, RFP process, so public process. Uh, University of Cincinnati Corrections Institute, uh, you know, did the, the validation study for us, uh, which was great on that end. Um, you know, and showed us that the tool was actually, you know, uh, doing what it needed to do for the most part. Uh, it was a large sample we validated on about 10,000 people. It's actually a little bit more. Um, but now, clearly, uh, with this opportunity to work with the Council of State Governments, uh, with some support from the Bureau of Justice Assistance, we saw it as a great opportunity to actually revalidate the tool. Uh, you know, on a much more kind of uh, probably granular level than we did the first time around. Because if I recall correctly, one of the some of the things you're looking for now are much more focused looking at issues of gender, race, bias, et cetera, than maybe the original validation. Is that fair? That's yeah, absolutely fair. So cool. Um, Tammy Joe. I'm curious, um, uh, how do I want to say this? Uh, it sounds like things are on a bit more of a, of a level playing field with some of the changes with the legislation and the fairness. Uh, and, and, and having looked at the legislation, I know there are many, many things, and you sort of alluded to that, that there's a large number of things. But, but specifically in terms of the validation of a tool and having this across the different systems and having... Um, hopefully a shared cutoff as opposed to the, the varied cutoffs that exist right now. How do you see this improving the lives of individuals who are on supervision that might be between the different systems and, and sometimes are on supervision in even more than one system? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, when Brian was talking, I was thinking about it. Our culture, um, as I started to talk about a little bit, was, you know, between the delivery systems was kind of challenging. Um, and we've kind of come across that. But at the same time, one of the interesting things in Minnesota is we might have been a little bit of ahead of the game, right? I mean, we started with the LSIR back in the early 90s, and then we came forward, and then we just kind of lost ground. And one of those areas that we lost ground is we did not move forward with some of that evidence-based practices that we now know, like you talked about, David, about the fact that um, having different cutoff scores in different areas or in um, having transparency. I mean, I, I was an LSI IR trainer and part of our process at that time was saying um, we don't share. You know, we didn't share at all. And so now the evidence tells us, wait a minute, we need to be transparent to help with motivational interviewing and bringing people forward. As part of that, that validation, like you said, we are looking forward to having a Across the state validation. We are way, as much as we were ahead of the game before, we've lost so much ground on that. Different pockets of our state have done validation studies, but the majority of the state has never done a validation of how this works individually for our populations. So we, we kind of got so far and then we just kind of dropped the ball at a certain point. And so we are again with CSG and BJA, looking forward to how do we develop those um, validation studies that are effective across our entire state so that we can provide those um, 
evidence-based practices um, addressing um, the challenges the people that we're serving face. I, re I realize that both of you, as I'm recalling, both of you, of course, in terms of the guidelines, specifically applied around the validation slash revalidation. Were there other items in the guidelines that you also uh, apply? And, and I know we've sort of talked about ultimately everyone's hope is to be able to meet, uh, you know, all of the guidelines down the road, whatever. But in terms of the specific application around technical assistance, I'm just curious, Brian, if there were other components, uh, and Tammy Jo, if there were other components that you uh, also particularly saw as a need right now in terms of focusing on. I'll start with you, Brian. Sure, thanks. Um, I, I know on our end in Massachusetts, um, it was really appealing around uh, communication. So, you know, uh, the validation study is really important, understanding all the information how the tool's functioning, um, whether or not it's having disparate impacts, all kind of foundational. Uh, but another foundational piece, I think, you know, I think as you kind of alluded to earlier, David, uh, communication is really something I think organizations struggle with in general, uh, especially around, you know, risk need responsivity instruments. So for us, it, it just was such an appealing opportunity to work on how to improve our communication uh, with, you know, the folks we're working with on our caseloads uh, all the way to, you know, external stakeholders, whether they be, you know, the general public, legislators, uh, any other kind of, um, you know, uh, impacted stakeholder in the system, you know, attorneys, both on the prosecuting side and the defense side. Uh, it just helps uh, on that end for us with um, the, the guidelines in general, you know, very much, I think, designed around supporting kind of the tenets of procedural justice. And, you know, being able to communicate is such an important part of uh, people understanding the work you're trying to do. And, and, you know, being able to effectively talk to people about you know, our decisions are unbiased and they're transparent. Um, you know, we're trying to give voice to folks uh, in the process as well and ensure that they know that they could trust us in the decisions we're making um, because our motivation is really to help them and to help the public at large. And um, I think the help that the council of state governments can, you know, provide on that in this process was really, again, just really appealing to us in Massachusetts on that end. Well, uh, glad to hear. <laughs> we, 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 we always, um, we, we, we always want to, uh, what's the word, provide value for the buck, right? Uh, and th these are big challenges. Th these are big challenges. They're, they're not one size fits all responses. Uh, and we can't move at the same speed, right? Whether it's parts of a state or different states, the the I th and I think that's important. And we didn't I didn't really talk about that earlier, but just sort of briefly, everybody needs to understand. I think that sometimes the process for this stuff t takes many years, uh, and, and sometimes it can take a decade easily. And and people need to sort of strategize about what can I do in year one, year two, year four, year six, and really think about that as opposed to getting overwhelmed with what can be a massive change that is necessary in any system. Frankly, no matter how small the system is, it's always a massive change. And then the bigger the system it is, the, the more so. Uh, Tammy John, I'm curious if there were other areas as well in terms of Minnesota that uh, folks were thinking about? Yes, um, but I'm going to add to something you just said, David, too. It's not just setting out, um, like, knowing it's going to take some time. Like, in Minnesota's case, we had a lot of setbacks at mm -hmm. different points during this journey um, that all of a sudden kind of put us at a stop for a period of time. And so it's, it's like you said, it's, it's many, many years, but also to know that there's going to be times there. It's like the whole cliche of one step forward, two steps back, you, yeah, you kind of go back point. and forth on a lot of different issues. 
Um, Minnesota is also looking at, you know, we, as I talked about, um, you know, looking at that training and fidelity piece, that continuous quality improvement, developing that, you know, looking through the validation at the, the disparities, but also we're hoping to add some trailer assessments that will um, assist us with, you know, having addressing some of those different populations um in a different way and so that's going to be part of our discussion with csg and that you're guiding us with is you know not only how do we do this with fidelity but how do we add pieces to it to help us moving forward great that that becomes so important i think in terms of some of our some of the earlier discussion which, which is uh if if i were to the, uh, if I were to critique the work that we did over a few decades, it would be the upside would be we finally figured out sort of key factors that are relevant. And the downside is, is that in some cases we threw out the baby with the bathwater to use the old phrase. And because it wasn't directly related, we, we thought it wasn't that important. And we now understand finally, and, and it's sort of like a duh moment, right? But we now understand finally like, well, gee, things like not having a home is really very impactful. You know, things like having food insecurity or having or being depressed or having an anxiety disorder or whatever, uh, you know, having trauma in, in one's life, which most of the folks that we see in the criminal justice system do, you know, we, we've sort of done that. And so I, I like to I like to think that finally, you know, perhaps a bit more slowly than I, we should have, finally we've come to understand we need to be looking at those other things as well and integrate them into what we know is the very solid base of the criminogenic thinking uh, and criminogenic factors that the the R and R model gives us. And and to be fair, I would I would say that the responsivity component of the model clearly thinks or wants those things to be looked at, it's that we just didn't do a good job of studying and understanding that component. But I think it does fit very much into that. Well, I appreciate what you both had to say. I don't know if you have any additional thoughts or comments before we move back to Laiz in terms of uh, a summary about things. But if you do, I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to uh, to make any final comment before we, we move on to uh, Laiz closing us out. Uh, Brian, any additional thought or thoughts? Uh, no, I mean, I just say thank you um, to to you all and to to our colleagues in Minnesota, um, Tim and Joe. I, the, we're certainly uh, appreciative of all of the support in helping us kind of, you know, continuously improve. Uh, and, you know, just nice to have colleagues to learn with as well uh, along, along for the ride and along on the journey. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Brian. Tammy Joe. I agree. I um it, our journey has felt very long <laughs> and and we've made you know, we've hit a lot of challenges and stop points and CSG and um, your staff have been there with us every step of the way, um, helping us make those connections with other parts of the country and other probation departments and um, help helping guide us through some of our challenges that are um, have been interesting, but we we're making it and we've, we've really made a lot of progress. So yes, I appreciate agreed. all the assistance. Uh, agreed. And you're, you're we're welcome. And we, we want to thank you guys because here's the reality. Our work happens when there are champions in systems, right? It's, a, it's effective when there are champions in systems. And when you don't have champions in systems, the work doesn't move forward as well. And I think that that's really important that the, the, at the end of the day, the credit does go to the states uh, who make the commitment, uh, and we may provide some uh, some assistance, but at the end of the day, we're not the ones that really make that change. And Lise is going to talk a little bit about those opportunities and for technical assistance. And the uh, one of our goals, in fact, is the development of peer-to-peer -peer learning sessions and situations for the different states and different folks that we're providing technical assistance to, to be able to work with one another and look at one another's challenges and successes and provide supports. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, ladies. Thank you so much, David. Uh, so as David just mentioned, let's talk about some resources and next steps that are available for this project. Um, 
First, we want to emphasize that the new material is not a new risk and needs assessment instrument, but rather a set of guidelines for using risk and needs assessment instrument. So um, we always want to highlight that point, um, especially for uh, new participants who haven't heard about the project before. Um, there are five resources available. On the screen, you will see a screenshot of the main page for the guidelines. These resources and the guidelines themselves were developed with a variety of audiences in mind. The six resources you'll find are a pair of FAQ documents. One is aimed at legislators and one at agency administrators. There is also an executive summary document aimed at practitioners and then the longer deep dive publication, which is aimed at researchers and others charged with implementing the guidelines. The fifth resource is a self-assessment tool. And the sixth resource is technical assistance. I will provide some more information about those last two resources. So when we look at the self-assessment tool, the tool helps assess the status of your efforts in preparation for adopting the guidelines. What you will find is that you'll be the tool provides you with the ability to rate each of the guidelines and their components. Um, and those are the items that David went through earlier in the presentation. For each of those guidelines, there are components and subcomponents. Um, and so the self-assessment tool allows you to rate each of those on a scale ranging from not planned to fully implemented. We highly recommend that the self-assessment be completed by folks responsible for selecting or implementing post-conviction risk and needs assessment instruments, um, people developing related policy, or those folks making decisions regarding their use. The self-assessment tool can be completed at multiple stages to track implementation progress over time. So what this means is you can complete it um, at the start or before you start adopting the guidelines, and then you can also um, complete it you know, at the year mark, six month mark, two year mark, um, and see how you've progressed through all of those stages and where you, the status of um, your implementation for each of those guidelines. Um, you can access the self-assessment tool at www.riskselfassessment.org. And uh, we also have a new visualized report, which is currently available for agencies who complete the self-assessment. The report provides a cleaner summary of your results, um, and is, you're able to see that status uh, just more visually, um, also by principles. And those are the four sections that David covered earlier. Now, when we look at technical assistance, we have technical assistance available to help elevate your practices, enhance fairness, and lead in implementing cutting edge strategies that benefit criminal justice agencies, individuals in the system, and your broader communities. All sites requesting technical assistance will receive tailored services based on your identified needs and goals, which will be discussed with our project team. There will also be peer connection opportunities available where you will have the chance to engage with other sites and learn from one another. There are different TA services you can request. These can include requests for resources, um, if you want us to review results of your self-assessment tool submission, um, adopting one or more of the guidelines, among a lot others. Corrections and community supervision agency administrators can really maximize the TA they receive by committing to improve the use of their assessments, improving transparency about processes, being willing to engage by sharing challenges and learning with our other sites, and by the collaborative engagement through TA and surveys that we may provide you. To fully implement the national guidelines, it is important for agencies to examine data from a race equity lens to ensure tools are used properly. Um, sorry, to ensure tools are used appropriately. Um, receiving TA will help establish your agency as a leader in the field on risk assessments, and we want agencies to be able to share their experiences with peers to assist other agencies with adopting the national guidelines. To request TA, please visit the Take Action tab on our website, which you can access right now by scanning the QR code on the screen. Once there, you can follow the links to the TA request form and submit your request so you can hear back from our project team. Please note, if you are not applying for TA, there are still many other ways to become involved. You can start by reviewing, reviewing our suite of resources available for a variety of audiences, 
You can take the self-assessment to evaluate the status of your agency's efforts in preparation for adopting the national guidelines later on. You can sign up for our newsletter or just stay up to date on any opportunities and future resources for this project. And if you have any questions, you can go ahead and submit those through the request for TA form um, or reach out to any of our project members and I'll provide that information in the next slide. So you can find contact information on this slide. Uh, you can see here for David, uh, myself, and uh, our, our colleague, Jennifer Casella. As you've noticed, there was also another member of our team avail, uh, on the presentation, Kendra Carroll. She's one of our policy analysts. So I just want to acknowledge her as well. And we have a second policy analyst who was not able to attend, Sephora Reynolds Tanner. So if you see any of those names, please uh, feel free to reach out to us. And David, um, I'll kick it back to you for any additional closing remarks. I just want to say thank you to both Brian and Tammy Joe for joining us this morning and for sharing what it is that uh, your states are doing and the work that you're all doing. It has been a uh, uh, it has been a pleasure spending several years in both of your states and look forward to spending at least a couple of more as we continue our work as we move forward. I also want to let folks that might be listening to this know that at APPA in Seattle, there will be an in-person presentation that some of our colleagues will be doing that will be will go more in depth on these 13 items. This was an overview and so we will be providing an additional presentation in person in Seattle at the end of February. And so anybody who's interested, please feel free to attend that session as that occurs. And with that, we will say thank you very much for listening. We appreciate it. And we hope that some of you will be in touch with us. We very much would like to provide technical assistance to as many states and jurisdictions as possible over the course of the coming few years. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much for listening and take care.